The presidents of the United States and Russia will meet virtually, and we already know that Ukraine is going to dominate their conversation. But there are other issues on the agenda as well. President Biden is expected to urge a diplomatic de-escalation over the growing tensions simmering around Ukraine. But the White House remains skeptical about whether the Russians will comply. U.S. officials say that together with its NATO allies, the White House is mulling a range of measures to deter a Russian invasion. Move to cut, moves to cut Russia off further from the international financial system and impose direct sanctions on Vladimir Putin's closest associates are reportedly on the cards if Russia chooses to invade. I think that it's not about threats. It's about conveying that uh, the right path forward here is through diplomacy. Uh, in the meantime, uh, on financial sanctions, we have consulted significantly with our allies and believe we have a path forward that would impose significant and severe harm on the Russian economy. You can call that a threat. You can call that a fact. You can call that preparation, whatever you want to call it. The leaders of France, Germany, Germany, Italy, Britain and the United States consulted yesterday and expressed their determination that the sovereignty of Ukraine must be respected. They committed to act to maintain peace in Europe. The U.S. is expected to boost its military presence in the region if Moscow escalates its military activities. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also spoke to Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, ahead of the Putin-Biden call. Uh, we've also been clear and we've heard from our allies, our NATO allies uh, including, uh, that we uh, believe there is an opportunity, a window before us to resolve this diplomatically, uh, chiefly through full implementation of uh, the Minsk agreements. Um, specifically, should Russia follow this path of confrontation and military action, uh, we have made clear to Moscow that we will respond resolutely. Uh, including with a range of what we have called high-impact economic measures uh, that we've refrained from using in the past. And it's that last clause. Last week, the Biden administration released a declassified assessment suggesting that Russia may have as many as 175,000 troops on the border by January. And U.S. officials fear that Putin could try to engage in a three-sided pincer invasion of the country. Experts weighing in on the possible outcomes of today's talks say they do not expect any breakthroughs. We don't know that Putin has made up his mind to use force, but what we do know is that he's putting the Russian military, the Russian security services in a place where they could act in a pretty sweeping way. You know, Ukraine is an issue that he's made no secret in public over the course of recent years of the significance that he and much of the Russian elite attach uh, to their view um, that they ought to have significant influence over Ukraine's choices. Our view as a policy matter is obviously to, you know, um, continue unwavering support for Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence. But I would never underestimate President Putin's risk appetite on Ukraine. So more now live from the aforementioned Stuart Smith, Weon's correspondent in Moscow, and also from Susan Terrani, Weon's correspondent joining us from New York City. And Stuart, President Putin insists he has no plans to invade Ukraine. He argues it's the Americans who are at fault. He claims their support of Ukraine is destabilizing the region. But is the Kremlin doing anything itself to de-escalate the crisis and offer any kind of olive branch to the White House ahead of this call? Well, I think it's key to understand exactly what you just said. The Kremlin does not see this as a crisis. It sees it as NATO, Western, U US hysteria over the fear around an action which it has no intention to implement, i.e. invade Ukraine. From the Russian point of view, it's moving troops around its sovereign territory. It can move them wherever it likes. And it's only the US reaction to that which has created any sort of what could be described as a crisis. But the Kremlin's frequently keen not to use that word because from the Kremlin point of view, everything is normal. It says it has no plans to invade Ukraine and that the status quo, although not perfect, 
is working, apart from the Minsk agreements which need to be implemented to try and create some sort of semblance of normality in the east of Ukraine. However, if you were looking for one thing ahead of the meeting that Russia has offered, there has been talk about trying to reset relations in terms of diplomatic staffing. Both the United States and Russia for years have been implementing tit-for-tat restrictions on the diplomatic staffing of their respective embassies and consulates in other countries. And we're now at a almost unprecedented minimum of diplomatic staff, both of Russians in the US and US diplomatic staff in Moscow. So one thing Moscow has suggested is resetting that to normal, no, no restrictions on staffing and bring up the numbers in both embassies. For example, right now, it's impossible for a Russian to get a tourist visa to go to the United States. That's how bad things are. So for Russia, this would be an olive branch. Now, Stuart, we know what Joe Biden wants from this conversation. He's looking for clarity about Vladimir Putin's intentions towards Ukraine. What does Vladimir Putin want from this chat? Well, we know what he publicly wants, and I think there's a distinction to be made there. Publicly, the Kremlin says that what Russia would like to get is in black and white, some kind of legal agreement that NATO, this Western military alliance, uh, which the US is a figurehead, uh, will agree not to expand eastwards. It's been something the, uh, Russia has been concerned about for decades, this eastward expansion of NATO. Russia would like to see confirmation that that won't happen. The United States is in no position on its own to unilaterally agree that. It would have to be discussed through NATO, but also... I think we've lost uh, contact with Stuart there in Moscow, but we got the gist of uh, what he was telling us about Russia's aims for this conversation. Let's go to Susan Terrani, uh, Weon's correspondent in New York. And Susan, give us some details of what kind of measures the Biden administration is indicating might follow any kind of Russian incursion or invasion of Ukraine that might take place. As we heard Simon Anthony Blink and the U.S. Secretary of State mention, and we've heard in recent days, we've heard of, quote, high impact sanctions. They've heard of, we've, they've talked about diplomacy, so on and so forth. Some measures uh, that we're expected to hear about are perhaps sanctions targeting Russia's oil and gas sectors, which haven't been done before. Uh, a lot of people want to see sanctions targeted at uh, the execution of the Nord Stream. Stream 2 pipeline. We'll have to see if President Biden really goes that far or not. But something that's on the table, which is being called the nuclear option, is uh, Russia's banking system, which they use the SWIFT banking system. And uh, perhaps having Russia get sort of knocked off of the SWIFT banking system and the telecommunication system if uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't sort of come in line with uh, Biden's uh, request and sort of retreating from Ukraine. Those those are some harsh sanction measures that perhaps will be on the table on the part of the Biden administration. There are talks that perhaps more troops being deployed, NATO troops to Poland and, of course, uh, more aid and military aid uh, to Ukraine as well as something Vladimir Putin has time and again noted that he really wants uh, to see an end to really coming into these talks as one of its main uh, issues that he wants to discuss. And Susan, how much pressure will Joe Biden face from Capitol Hill to take tougher action? Uh, because after all, the last Republican president, Donald Trump, wasn't exactly ever particularly hard on the Russian leader. You know, this is an issue that really enjoys bipartisan support, uh, not only on Capitol Hill, among the American public polls, constantly uh, conducted, really see a consistency, and they want to see the U.S. president be tough on Russia, uh, not only during these talks, but the previous talks as well. Capitol Hill wants to see a clear-cut message sent to Vladimir Putin, but there is also nuances to that, and that's the fact that 
President Biden needs to make clear to Vladimir Putin that he means business. Is he willing to go all out, all out uh, in helping Ukraine integrate with the West? Will he be able to really uh, support Ukraine in case Putin decides to have some kind of aggression or invasion against Ukraine? And does he really mean business with these hard-hitting sanctions? If not, I think a lot of members on Capitol Hill and all of Americans are concerned that you know, Putin draws some kind of red line for Biden, as he did, if you remember, years ago with Obama. And Biden doesn't see and meet those red lines and then is humiliated on the world stage. So I think dignity is very important right now and also sort of a, a sense of face-saving um, uh, approach at the end of the day as well. But yes, he is under a lot of pressure. As you mentioned, um, perhaps there won't be a huge breakthrough after these talks, uh, but I think we'll get a sense of uh, where the United States and uh, Russia stand uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of moving forward regarding this particular issue. It's going to be very interesting, and it all kicks off in about 75 minutes' time, that call between President Biden and President Putin, a virtual summit. Susan Terrani, Weon's correspondent, live in New York. Thanks for that, and thanks also to Stuart Smith for joining us from Moscow.